scripture reading tonight will be from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. It's 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from sin. If we say that we do not have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. There in First John chapter one verses five through ten, we'll be there uh, shortly. Uh, tonight's topic is a, another topic that's one of the the other questions from our our twelve questions campaign. The ones that maybe we we haven't got to in our twelve questions, and, and we won't get to that. We've got again one more of those this. Uh, this uh, Wednesday night, and hope that you'll be able to be a part of that at 7 o'clock here. We'll be talking about the, the really the most important question, how can I know that I'm saved? How can I, I know that I've done what God has told me to do, the things that God has told me to do? And even how can I be confident in my salvation? Which I think is something that maybe sometimes even we as Christians struggle with, is being confident in our salvation. Uh, so I hope that you'll be able to make sure that you're here for that um, this Wednesday night. Uh, tonight's topic is the tenth leading cause uh, of death in America. In 2014, there were 400, sorry, 42,773 suicides reported. That's one every 12 minutes. That means during our hour long worship series, uh, worship uh, time, about five people statistically will commit suicide. After cancer and heart disease, suicide is responsible for, for more years of life lost. Than any other cause of death. And each of us, in some way, have probably been affected uh, by suicide. Maybe someone that, that we know or someone that we love, a family member or a friend, or maybe a friend or family member of someone that we love. Some catalyst or some things that, uh, that, that put the stress on an individual to, to commit this act. Uh, there's, there's a number of them. This is not an extensive, an extensive lift, but there, there are things that all of us maybe at some point uh, deal with. Uh, the death of a loved one, perhaps a divorce or separation or a breakup of a relationship, uh, the loss of custody of children, a serious loss such as a job or, or losing your house or losing a, a substantial amount of money. Serious and terminal illnesses sometimes are a catalyst for suicide. A serious accident, chronic physical pain, intense emotional pain, a loss of hope or feeling helpless, being victimized, whether that is domestic or rape or assault, or perhaps victimization of a loved one, physical, verbal, or sexual abuse, feeling trapped in a situation that you perceive to be negative, feeling like things will never get better, perhaps serious legal issues, perhaps even going to jail, being in a humiliating situation or feeling like a total failure, alcohol or drug abuse, or a feeling of not being accepted by family or friends or society. Again, those are just some of the things that sometimes lead people to take the action to commit suicide. And suicide is a, a complex issue uh, that, that Scripture doesn't specifically address. There are examples of suicide in Scripture. We can read about a number of those. Probably the, the most prominent one that we're aware of is, is Judas. After he betrays Jesus, he commits suicide by, by hanging himself. We're all probably fairly familiar with that one. I, I'm not going to claim to, to have all the answers when it comes to suicide tonight, but I want us to, to look at this complex issue honestly from Scripture and notice some scriptural principles uh, that we can apply to this and see what lessons that we can learn. And again, it's, it's a big deal because people ask this question. People wonder about this. The, the, the person who asked this was actually a, a teenager that I met at a youth rally uh, back in December at Exposure. And, uh, and she, her, her question was, uh, what happens to those who commit suicide? And does God take their mental state into account? And we talked about that a little bit last week, right? We talked about mental state and, and, and that sort of thing last week. And, and perhaps that, that's part of it. Again, we're going to uh, define suicide tonight. And, and that's, this is not a, a perfect definition of suicide. But we're going to define def uh, suicide tonight as a voluntary or intentional 
uh, act to take one's own life, voluntary or intentional, meaningful, purposeful, uh, taking one's own life. Now, when we think about mental state, these, when we think about suicide and mental state, this isn't the same thing as what we talked about last week. You know, last week we talked about those who have diminished mental capability, right? Uh, that, that permanently throughout their life they can, they can perhaps only attain to such a, such a level of mental capability. This is different, right? Uh, perhaps in the moment of suicide, some people might be, uh, because of anger or because of depression or because of many of these other catalysts, they may be not thinking right uh, in, in, in that instance. And in that instance, they take their own lives. And we can understand that. Um, the, the issue that, that we would have with that, and maybe the issue that you would think about with that is, is could that lead to a, a slippery slope of saying, well, I just did it in anger, or I just wasn't in my right mind, so I'm not, I'm not responsible for that. And we'll, we'll get to that more in, in a little bit. Again, I, when we think about that... Um, not all of us struggle with depression. Some people struggle with depression. So not all of us struggle with anger. Maybe some people struggle with anger. Um, maybe sadness or, or whatever else it might be. But uh, in, in my life, I, I've done things in anger where um, probably in, in the, the heat of the moment, I did things that normally I wouldn't do. Am I still responsible for that? That's, that's kind of a question to, to think about and to consider. And, and where is that, that line to where I'm... I'm not in my right mind and I'm, I'm not responsible for it, to where, or I am in my right mind and I am still responsible for that. And again, that's, that's the tough question when it comes to suicide, that I'm not going to claim to have a perfect answer, but I'm going to claim that God has a perfect answer. And again, we'll get to that here shortly. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for individuals aged 15 to 34. And it's the third leading cause of death for individuals, in, individuals listen to this, 10 to 14. Young people, children, are committing suicide. I saw in my study of this for, that for teenagers specifically, there are as many as 25 attempted suicides for every one successful suicide. So for every one successful teenager that commits suicide, 25 times other people, other teenagers have attempted suicide. It's a real issue uh, in our nation. It's a real issue even within the church. So here's the question. Is suicide sin? It's a complex issue. Let's have an honest look at Scripture. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You can keep your uh, 1 John marked, if you will. We'll get there eventually. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Read verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Now, 1 Corinthians is written to Christians... Uh, so this is specifically addressed to Christians. What's being addressed in verses 19 of 20 of chapter 6 is for Christians. But perhaps I think we could make, say the principle would apply to, to all people. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, here's the principle, glorify God in your body. Now clearly this is written to Christians. We're the only people who have the Holy Spirit, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit as Christians. But what's the, the point of it that, that Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians? Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, because we are Christians, because our bodies do not belong to us anymore, we should glorify God in our bodies. With our lives, with our physical being, we should glorify God in our lives. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, Exodus chapter 20 is where we read those, uh, the first time we read the Ten Commandments. What's one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not murder. Uh, in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, uh, murderers are listed with a, a, a list of, of others who will um, go into the, the second death. And what's that referring to? Those folks will go to hell. Uh, that's what that is referring to. So, so murderers is commanded against murdering. Murderers are those who, who will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will go to hell. And if we define suicide as voluntarily or intentionally taking one's own life, then you could look at it as suicide is murdering oneself. And therefore it would be sin. It's sinful for Christians to purposefully harm or to kill yourself because we're supposed to glorify God in our bodies. To purposefully do that is sin. Is it unforgivable? That, that's maybe the, the issue that many people have about suicide. Is, is, is suicide an unforgivable sin? In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31, Jesus tells us there's only one unforgivable sin. 
And guess what it's not? It's not suicide. In, in Matthew chapter 12, and verse 31, Jesus says, Any sin shall be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? For tonight's purposes, it's not suicide, so that makes it pretty clear is what we're talking about. But what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It is claiming that, that Jesus' miracle specifically, God's power, came not from God, but from Satan, from the devil. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, attributing God things to Satan's power. Uh, that's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. So, is if that's the only unforgivable sin, and it's not suicide, does that mean that suicide is forgivable? It would seem as if the Scripture would teach us that it is. Is it the sin leading to death? In 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, it talks about uh, a couple of different types of sin. It talks about sin not leading to death, and it talks about sin which does lead to death. And he's, uh, John's telling the, the readers there to, to pray for those who have sin in their life that doesn't lead to death. But he says, but you, you, I'm not telling you to pray for those who have sin in their life that leads to death. Well, what is the sin that leads to death? Well, he doesn't give a specific answer, but it, but it seems to be in the context of it and, and what we would study of other scriptures that is, it is sin which leads to spiritual loss. Now, all sin leads to spiritual loss, right? But what sin will ultimately lead to spiritual loss? Unforgiven sin. Unrepented of sin. So this sin that leads to death is sin for which forgiveness isn't sought. Perhaps referring to the sin that happens for people who have hardened hearts, people who are not seeking forgiveness, people who are not interested in forgiveness, people who know the truth but deny the truth, turn away from the truth. Hebrews talks about that a little bit, that there comes a point in time where a sacrifice no longer remains, but only that terrifying expectation of things to come. So, when we think about suicide, it's not the unforgivable sin, that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's not the sin which leads to death, necessarily, um, because that is just sin which is unrepented of, or sin which, for which forgiveness isn't sought. And maybe that's the, the more difficult one that we'll address as we go forward. So here, here's what I've come up with in my thoughts, thinking what Scripture teaches. Under what circumstances can someone who commits suicide be forgiven? Under what circumstances can someone who commits suicide be forgiven? First of all, we, we must realize, for the non-Christian, for someone who is not a Christian, suicide will not be forgiven. If someone dies in their sin as someone who's not a Christian, no matter what type of death they experience, they have sin in their life that is unforgiven. They're not saved from that sin, and therefore they will be punished eternally. But what about from the, the Christian? So for the non-Christian, there, there is perhaps you could say one type of suicide that could be forgiven, a failed suicide, right? Because they would still have the opportunity to seek forgiveness and to seek salvation. That would be the only type of suicide that could be uh, forgiven because they could still seek that salvation and that forgiveness. What, what about for the Christian? The same would be true for a Christian. A failed attempt could certainly be uh, sought forgiveness for. Uh, number two, accidental. When we think about that, that kind of fails with, with our, our, again, simple definition of suicide, right? Uh, if it's accidental, it doesn't fall into our purposeful, intentional taking one's own life. But if someone were to accidentally kill themselves, it's not suicide, and it's not a sin. The Old Testament makes a, a clear distinction even between murdering someone else and, and accidentally killing someone else. So certainly the same would be true of ourselves. Uh, just because we do something that, that's foolish, uh, doesn't, and, and it leads to our death perhaps, or we make a poor decision that leads to our death, it's not suicide in that way, and we're not held responsible for that. And thirdly, and perhaps what, we, what we've talked about is, again, uh, those who are, are mentally limited. Uh, for any of those reasons that we listed above as we began the, the sermon, all those, all those stressors that might lead someone to take that action, any of those and any number of other things, uh, if, if, if a Christian acts while he or she is temporarily not thinking right, temporarily out of their mind, uh, again, that sin could be forgiven. But again, it could lead to a slippery slope, couldn't it? Where people could say, well, I was, just, I was just out of my mind at that instance, or I wasn't, I wasn't thinking right, therefore I'm, I, you can't hold me responsible for that. And if we go too far down that way, we, we can see that that would, that would cause trouble, right? That everyone, whenever they sin, that, that would just be their excuse. And they may, they may trick some people, or they may trick everyone, but turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Here's why, as far as God is concerned, I'm not concerned about that. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 10. Verse 10. 
<clears throat> Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. God knows. God knows our thoughts and our intentions. God knows our reasoning. So if a, a Christian commits suicide, and that happens more, much more often than we would probably uh, like to experience. I have uh, been to homes where that has happened. I have washed blood off of driveways uh, from where someone committed suicide. I, I've been there. I've experienced it. Uh, some of you have as well. It's a, it's a big deal. When a Christian commits suicide, is it unforgivable? Well, it's not an unforgivable sin. Scripture teaches that there's only one unforgivable sin. Is it the sin that leads to death? We're going to get into to that shortly, and this is going to be the, the main thing. But as far as, well, were they, were they mentally limited or not? Perhaps. But again, I, I don't know. And, and more than likely, you probably don't know. But who does? God. God knows perfectly well. Absolutely perfectly well. He searches the mind. He tests the heart. He knows our purposes, our reasonings, the, the, the intentions, and the reasons that we do the things that we do. For us to really understand maybe that, that question that, that I haven't answered, uh, let's turn to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. For the Christian who commits suicide, uh, is it possible for them to be forgiven? If they, if they successfully commit suicide and they don't ask for forgiveness, is it possible for that sin to be forgiven? 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Let's read that again. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. A passage you've probably studied many times before, and a passage that is, if we understand it correctly, extremely encouraging. What does it mean to, to walk in the light? He says that those who, who walk in the light, the, the blood of Jesus continually cleanses, this, cleanses them from, from all sin. That's what we want, right? We want all of our sins cleansed. We want all of our sins washed away. Well, He says we have to walk in the light. Well, what does it mean to walk in the light? Turn over to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Notice how Jesus defines walking in the light or, or following after Him. It says we are to walk in the light as, as He is in the light. Well, what does Luke say about, what does Jesus say about following Him? Luke chapter 9 verses 23 through 26. And He, that's Jesus, was saying to them, If anyone wishes to come after Me, to follow Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow Me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. What does it mean to walk in the light? Well, that means today, when I woke up, and every second that I, I live this life, I picked up my cross, I picked up the burden, I picked up the responsibility, I picked up the things that I should do, and I picked up the things that I ought not to do, and I followed after Jesus. I tried to do things God's way. I tried to gain Christ and not worry about gaining the world. It sounds a lot like Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself up for me. I try to say the things that God would say. Do the things that God would do. Stand for the things that he would stand for. I can't live my own life anymore. I'm dead and Christ lives in me. When I am that Christian, when I am the person who's, who's walking in the light, it means that I have fellowship with Jesus. Turn back to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Notice verse 3 and then verses 6 and 7. When we walk in the light, it means we have fellowship. Verse 3, 
What we have seen and we have heard we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We want to have fellowship with God. We want to have fellowship with Christ. Notice verse 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with Him, we want to have that, and yet walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. Again, verse 7, that's what we want. We want. We want to walk in the light. We want to have fellowship with Jesus. We want His blood to continually cleanse us from all of our sins. Verse 6 tells us how we do that. If we say we have fellowship, but yet we walk in darkness, then, then we lie. We have to walk in the light. And walking in the light means picking up those burdens, picking up our cross, and following after Him. Trying to do things that God would have us to do. Live the life that God would have us to live. Now, sometimes when we read those verses, some people think, some people have serious thoughts about, well, that means that I I have to live sin-free as a Christian. And if you just read those verses, that might be what you get out of this passage. But if you actually read the entire context, you'll see that there's nothing further from the truth. There is sin for the Christian. You as a Christian have sinned even after you became a Christian. So have I, and so has everyone who's ever been a Christian. Notice verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, this is writing to Christians. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and the Word is not in us. If we say we have no sin, if we, if we claim as Christians to not have sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth isn't in us, we make God a liar and His Word is not in us. Christians have sin. So you can walk in the light, and there still be instances where you sin. But notice there's a difference between walking in the light and having sin in your life versus living in sin. And when you live in sin, you walk in darkness. There's a difference there. I'm going to fail as a Christian. I'm I'm never going to live up to God's glory. I'm never going to to, to perfectly live this Christian life. There will be times when I fail and when I mess up and when I fall short. But if I continually do that, if I do that as a habit, if I choose to do that over and over and over again, then I'm not walking in the light and messing up every now and then. I'm walking in darkness. I'm not living the type of life that God would have me to live. There's a difference there. Christians have sin in their life. But Christians don't live in sin. And that's what we must understand, especially when it comes to the topic tonight. Again, verse 9, it talks about confessing sin. Let's read it in verse 9 again. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's the difference between forgiveness for a Christian and forgiveness for someone who's not a Christian. If you want forgiveness and you're not a Christian, you can't just confess your sin, ask for forgiveness, and receive it. That's not the biblical way. If you're not a Christian, you have to hear about Jesus, believe in Him, repent of your sins, confess Him as your Lord, and be baptized so that your sins can be forgiven. But once you become a Christian, all you have to do is confess your sins to Him, ask for forgiveness, and in that instance, His blood cleanses you. If you're doing it with a right heart and and truly meaning that, truly intentionally trying to seek forgiveness. In James chapter 5 and verse 16... James says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Again, 1 John says that He, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's a question that relates specifically to to suicide. And again, I don't know that there's... I I didn't find in my study of this topic, I did not find a, a perfectly, absolutely clear answer to what happens to the Christian who commits suicide. I didn't find it. Hopefully some of these principles that we've already talked about have helped you a little bit, and hopefully this one will too. What if I, as a Christian, what if you, as a Christian, die and you have sin that you haven't asked forgiveness for? What will happen to you? If you you have sin in your life, and again, I'm not talking about walking in darkness. I'm not talking about living in sin. I'm talking about you're walking in the light. You're doing what we would consider to be a good job, but, but you mess up, but you fall short, 
And, and maybe because of that sin or, or shortly thereafter that sin. And maybe it's, even, maybe it's even you don't even realize that you've sinned. Maybe you said something to someone and, 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 that, uh, it, and you shouldn't have said it in such a way. And, and sometimes our words can even be sin. Maybe you didn't even realize it. If you, if you die with an instance of sin in your life, not again with living in sin in your life, but with an instance of sin in your life, and you don't ask forgiveness of that before you die, what will happen to you? Again, notice verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10. If we say we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie, and do not practice the truth. Okay, so that's one verse that we would think about. If we, if we say we have fellowship with Him, and we, but we walk in sin, or yet we practice, sorry, we walk in darkness, uh, we lie, and do not practice the truth. Verse 8, but for the Christian, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In verse 10, if we say that we are, have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Christians, you sin, and I sin. If I die in that instance where I have not verbally said or mentally said, God, please forgive me of this, I haven't, perhaps I haven't even recognized that I have sinned, what will happen to us? I can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if I ask forgiveness of sins, I will be forgiven. I can know that beyond the shadow of a doubt. But there's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference between walking in darkness and committing sin. There's a difference. Someone living in sin is walking in darkness. Someone who is a Christian who commits sin isn't necessarily, necessarily walking in darkness. And if they're walking in the light, what happens? Verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. It would be, perhaps I would have to say this is my opinion, because I don't know that Scripture specifically says this, but if someone is a Christian walking in the light... And they sin, and they die shortly thereafter before realizing or before verbally saying, God, please forgive me of this sin. I confess it to you. It would be my opinion that the blood of Christ would cleanse them of that sin. Why? Because they are walking in the light. Again, God knows. You might trick me. I might trick you. But God knows. He knows if you're really walking in the light or not. He knows if you're walking in the light and you're here every Sunday, or if you're not walking in the light, you're walking in darkness and you're still here every Sunday. God knows if you're walking in the light or if you're walking in darkness. And probably you know too. But what happens to that person who dies in an instance of sin? It would seem as if, if they're walking in the light, that their, their sins would be continually cleansed by the blood of Christ. Could that principle, if correct, could that principle be applied to suicide? I think it could be. If someone is walking in the light and in an instance of sin commits suicide, could that sin be forgiven? I think it could be. Again, God knows it's His job, and I'm glad that it is. It's a, it's a complex issue. It's something that we need to, to think about. It's something that many people around us struggle with and deal with. And we need to have some sort of answer to that question. And again, this answer tonight may not be perfectly clear, and you may think it's not a very good answer at all. Uh, but it's the principles that I found in Scripture that I think we need to apply. Here are some concluding thoughts on suicide, because I, I have no doubt that even some here have struggled with that. Some people in Scripture, and as a matter of fact, many people in Scripture, felt deep despair in life. Solomon, in his pursuit of pleasure, reached the point where he hated life. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 17. Elijah was fearful, depressed, and yearned for death, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4. Jonah was so angry at God that he wished to die, Jonah chapter 4 and verse 8. And even the Apostle Paul and his missionary companions were under great pressure, far beyond their ability to endure, so that they despaired of life itself, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. However, none of these committed suicide. Solomon learned to fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Elijah was comforted, allowed to rest, and given a new commission. Jonah received abonition, abonition and rebuke from God. And Paul learned that although the pressure that he faced was beyond his ability to endure, that the Lord can bear all things. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 says, This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, 
but on God who raises the dead. Suicide, again, is a, is a big deal. Of course, it's a big deal physically. Uh, when we end our lives, uh, we, we leave behind a lot of issues. Sometimes people look at suicide as the answer to all of their problems. It's not an answer to any problems. Uh, and it gives only more problems to those people who are left behind afterwards. And certainly it's a big deal spiritually. If you're not a Christian and you die through suicide, then you have absolutely no hope. Absolutely no hope if you die in that state. If you die in a lost state, whether through suicide or whatever other way you may die, you have absolutely no hope. For the Christian, it's certainly not what God wants from you. He wants you to glorify Him in your body. But is it forgivable for the Christian in circumstances that God and perhaps God alone can clearly understand? It seems as if it is. If you're walking in the light, the blood of Jesus continually cleanses you from all sin, perhaps even the sin of suicide. Not an easy topic, not a topic that, that would certainly be easy. That'd be a long conversation with someone if you were trying to have this conversation with someone face to face. But it's a, a, a topic that we need to think about. We need to talk about because in my experience over the last few years, it's only become more prevalent uh, for people to commit suicide. I, I can remember when I was in high school, we had uh, my entire four years in high school, maybe, probably my entire 12 years in school period, we had one, one guy who committed suicide that I remember. But today, especially our children, they, there seem to be suicide attempts frequently. Remember that, that stat that I said earlier, for every successful teenage suicide, there's 25 attempts. And that in an hour time period, there will be 12 successful suicides. Over 42,000 suicides in one year is the average. It, it's a big deal. It's a big problem. It's, it's a, a reality of the world that we live in. And we need to have a, a biblical answer, a biblical viewpoint on what happens to those who commit suicide. If you've struggled with that before, I encourage you to, to hold on like those people that we talked about there at the end of the lesson. They, they despised life. They desired death. They wanted to, to end their lives, but they didn't. And because they didn't, God was able to continue to use them for good things. So if you've thought about that, I encourage you to talk to someone about it, uh, to talk to, to many people about it. Uh, and it's most importantly, to study Scripture and see how God can use you even through the difficulties of your life. And if that's never been a struggle for you, great. I'm glad. And I hope it never is. But realize there are people around you that it is a real struggle with them. If you have any needs tonight, please come as we stand and sing. On a hill.